So I started with the OFA in 1987. So I've been there 32 years now. And it's amazing, looking back on it, that when I started, the HIP data database was the sole database. So then the elbow database started about 1990, the mid, the mid nine, or yeah, about 1990, the mid 90s, we picked up the thyroid, the patella, and the cardiac databases. And then so far in the 2000s, there's been explosions. We've inherited some databases from another registry that uh, turned over their data to us. And then the explosive diagnostic stuff right now are the DNA tests. I mean, that's changing on a daily basis. So primarily we're gonna start, we're gonna to concentrate today on the, the primary three, hips, elbows, thyroid, patella luxation, and cardiac. So as was mentioned earlier, the purpose of any database is to offer a standardized evaluation um, with the hips, we're using the hip extended view, the VD hip extended view, which is the primary positioning that most databases around the world will, will employ to offer phenotypically normal, we're here to identify phenotypically normal dogs. It was never OFA's intent to identify the percent dysplasia in any breed or the percent affected for any disease in any breed. It's OFA's purpose to identify phenotypically normal dogs to be used for breeding. To maintain these databases over time, we're just not gonna issue a report to the owner and then bury it someplace. This is maintained over time. It's available to the public to disseminate this information through our website. This is the very granite of the OFA website and all the data that's available out there. So with the hips, like I mentioned, we use the standard hip extended view. There's nine different points that the consulting radiologist will look at. And over the years, since the very beginning, back in 66, OFA has always employed veterinary radiologists to evaluate the hip film. We have never used students. Even today, after I've been there 32 years, looking back on I still get calls in about what's from an owner, especially, saying that, well, my veterinarian said that they evaluated the hip radiographs back when they were in school or they had students do it. It's never been that case. So typically, we will look at nine, approximately nine different points on each hip. The most important, the several most important to me is what you'll see is number one, which is kind of the surface of the femoral head here with the front surface of the socket of the acetabulum. The farther these two surfaces are parallel in general determines the difference between, between the grades of normal. So excellent, good, and fair. So the farther the two surfaces are parallel, the deeper the femoral head sitting into the acetabulum, and as a rule, the better the hip. The second one, right, let's go is number seven, this hash mark. A lot of veterinarians and owners will mistakenly will identify percent coverage of the femoral head within the acetabulum by drawing a line from the cranial tip of the acetabulum here to the caudal tip of the acetabulum. And figuring that portion of the femoral head that's within that line is the percent coverage, and that's not the case. The percent coverage is actually this hash mark here because that represents the lateral dorsal rim of the acetabulum. And that surface will vary greatly from breed to breed. Chinese Sharpe typically will have this S-curve type shape that you see on a hash mark, whereas you get into most other breeds like Labs, Rottweilers, Golden Retrievers, this, that hash mark line will actually be straight, cranial and caudal. The other one that I'll routinely hear is number four. Owners will call in and say, my veterinarian was going over the hip image with me, and they're concerned about this flat spot on the femoral head. And it's a completely normal structure. It's called the fovea capitis, where the round ligament attaches. You may or may not see it on a hip radiograph, depending on how the femur is rotated. Lastly, we get into the two areas, which is the femoral neck here, and then the margins of the, of the acetabulum, both cranial and caudal. This is where we'll typically see the remodeling changes. We get into the more dysplastic dogs, like the moderate and the severe. I said most registries will employ the hip extended VD view of the hip, but most others, like the BVA, the British Veterinary Association, the Federal Cytological International, FCI, which is used by most of the European countries, they will also do what's called a Norberg angle. 
and it's an objective measurement of the percent coverage. So with the Norberg angle, what you do is establish approximately the center of the femoral head on one hip, draw a line across to the other hip and establish the center of the head, and come back to the center of the femoral head on this side, draw a line just tangent with the cranial edge of the, of the acetabulum. The angle that's formed there is called the Norberg angle and is generally reported in the literature as being 105 degrees or greater for a normal hip. What we'll see in a retrospective study that Dr. Tomlinson, a surgeon, did at the University of Missouri, he approached OFA, we supplied him with hundreds of hip radiographs on these four breeds of all different grades of, of the hip, from excellent being number one to severely dysplastic being number six. And what he did is he went back and re measured the Norberg angle and what he found didn't necessarily surprise me, but it, it, could, it makes sense to me, but I'm sitting there as a radiologist looking at these hip images all day long, that number one, which is the excellent, and number twos, regardless of the breed, the Norberg angle is very close. And in every one of these four breeds, the normal Norberg angle was much greater than 105. In the labs, in the rots, it would approach 110, sometimes 115 degrees. But there was variation between, you can't compare the Labrador to the rot, or, or actually, I take that back, Labrador and rot were pretty close, and then the German Shepherd and the Golden Retriever were pretty close. Where we started getting into the gray area was between the three and four. That represents the dogs with fair hips and the dogs with mildly dysplastic hips. All right, as Dr. Rendano mentioned earlier, this is an example of the standard VD hip view with the hips extended. The examples I'm gonna show you here are all Labrador retrievers. So I make a point here by saying, as he did earlier, that every breed is registered against, or every dog is registered against other members of the same breed. You cannot compare an English Bulldog or a Pug to let's say a, a Cardigan or a Pembroke. Entirely different worlds, nor can you take that Pembroke or Corrigan and then compare it to the same hip image as you would on a Rot or a Labrador. It's got to be breed dependent. So this is a Labrador Retriever. This happens to be an excellent. The big thing here is the, the two surfaces I was mentioned earlier, is the cranial portion of the acetabulum and the articular surface of the femoral head sits very deeply and then the outer edge of the, of the uh, dorsal rim of the acetabulum is, represents this line here. So this whole inner portion of the femoral head, which actually has a wider appearance in color, that's the percent of the femoral head that's actually covered within the acetabulum. This is an example of good. So again, you can't argue that this is truly a normal hip. It's just that those two surfaces aren't quite as parallel or as kind of neat and clean as the previous image. The other thing to understand here is with OFA, we're the only hip registry that on dogs two years of age and older, number one, do we use two years of age as a minimum, but we're the only registry that requires that a dog over two be evaluated independently by three different radiologists. And it's that consensus that we report then to the owner. So in these examples I'm showing you here, all three of the radiologists have come back and said, it's excellent. Or in this case, all three came back and said it was good. So we go from the good to an example of a fair, and it's pretty easy to see now the congruency of the femoral head, especially on this right side, isn't as good as the previous two examples we, we, I showed you. There's no remodeling. The femoral neck or right here has a little bit different appearance in that you can see like the physis of the capitis here. Then there's a second line here. That represents a change in where the joint capsule attaches. So it's a minor deviation in the fair dog. It will contribute to the fair grade, but it's not going to fail the dog. The other thing unique to this image that I want to point out is that if you'll notice the appearance of L7, on this side, we have a transverse process, just like you normally would have on lumbar vertebrae. On the opposite side, 
you have solid bone. The, you can see the transverse process, the edge comes here, but then it comes down and it blends into the, into the pelvis. This is a transitional vertebrae. This will be noted on the owner's report as well as the veterinarian's along with the finding of spondylosis in certain cases. The OFA board has us note this because there is an inherited component to both of these abnormalities. And while it doesn't preclude the owner from breeding this dog, since it's a, it's a normal dog with a fair, we would we'd recommend that the dog not be bred to a mate that has a similar anecdotal finding. This is an image is a, is a little lighter, but it's an example of a mild, and you can see now that the femoral head, the surface of the femoral head, is not parallel with the front portion of the, of the acetabulum for much of a degree at all. This is where we start getting into some of the issues between the fair and the mild, but again, you gotta realize that it's a consensus evaluation. In a situation like this, at least two of the radiologists have read the dog as mildly dysplastic. By the time we get in to, to severe, to the, well, in this case, a moderate hip dysplasia, it's kind of a no-brainer. Obviously, the, the, the dog has, is, the hips are subluxated. There's remodeling of the femoral neck on both sides. There's some minor arthritic changes, osteophytes on the caudal acetabular margin of the acetabulum. It's a little hard to see, but on the right hip, you can tell that that upper margin, the, the, the lateral acetabular margin is notched inward. That all creates to a decrease in percent coverage of the femoral head. And then kind of the no-brainer, by the time you get to the severe, you put it on the view box, you look at the owner and tell them, don't waste your money. Because we have obviously dysplastic dog, a subluxated, marked remodeling of the femoral necks, acetabular rim changes, huge osteophyte on the, on the cranial margin of the, of the left acetabulum, also additional remodeling of the caudal acetabular mar margin. I made the comment about telling the owner not to send it in, and it's a good point, because a lot of these dogs, they don't get sent in. We realize that, why should the owner spend the money to have OFA tell you the same thing? Some breeders will insist if it's a dog that they sold that it be sent in so they can verify it with o OFA, but we've realized from the get-go that some of these grossly dysplastic dogs are not gonna enter our database. But it goes back to the issue that we're in the business of identifying phenotypically normal dogs. Those are your breeding dogs. While all three of the examples of the dysplastic dogs I showed you, both hips were involved, bilateral disease, it is not all uncommon to see unilateral hip dysplasia. It's reported in humans, 10 times more prevalent in the left hip than the right hip, more prevalent in women than in men, OFA f matches this, the frequency and the distribution pretty much, except that it's breed dependent. In Rottweilers, if an owner tells me that the, the dog is dysplastic in one hip, I will pick the right hip and I will win the majority of the time. If they tell me it's a Golden, a Lab, Bernese Mountain Dog, Akita, I will pick the left hip and I will win the majority of the time. If they tell me it's a German Shepherd, I'm not gonna pick because it's 50-50. There's no sex predilection, but there's definitely a breed dependency. We see much more unilateral hip dysplasia, let's say in um, the Pembroke Welsh, Welsh Corgi, than we do in Rottweilers. But if it is in a Rottweiler, it's gonna be in a right hip. OFA uses a pool of veterinary radiologists. We usually try and maintain about 20, sometimes as many as 23. The images that we receive after I screen them initially at the office for proper positioning, which I will screen every image that comes through. If I don't think the positioning or the technique is acceptable, I will, in today's world, since most of them, over 95% of them are digital and they're transmitted electronically, I will have the ladies email the clinic back and say, you really need to consider redoing this because of pelvic rotation technique, whatever the issue may be. The outside radiologists also have the ability to decline to read an image if I think it's acceptable. And sometimes this will happen because I'm the only one that knows where, who the owner is, where the owner is located in relationship to the veterinary clinic. Some of these people will drive hundreds of miles to go to a veterinarian. 
sometimes in that long visit, they've paid their money to have the dog anesthetized, so this is an additional expense, and then for me to demand that the owner take the dog back, sometimes is realist, unrealistic. So if it's kind of a marginal issue, I will kind of bite the bullet, I'll accept the image, put it through the evaluation process, see how it goes. If the outside radiologists don't like it, fine, I have to have it redone. Or if the owner calls later on and say, I think didn't, I didn't really like this or like that, fine. They always have the option of redoing the dog. They can always resubmit. But it's an independent evaluation of three different radiologists. The way that works is if two read the dog excellent, one reads it good, the dog's going to receive an excellent. If two read the dog fair, one reads it mildly dysplastic, it's going to receive a fair. It's a majority rule, basically. And we know over time that in 92% of the time, or a little greater than 92% of the time, all three radiologists will read the dog the same. They'll all read it normal, or they'll all read it dysplastic. And like 96% of the time, they'll all be within one grade of another. So the example is two read it, two read it good, one read it fair. Or two read it mildly dysplastic, and one read it moderate. So when you think about the general agreement between three independent radiologists, these people are scattered all over the United States in academia and private practice. I'm the only one that has access to all the data that's fed back into OFA. I think those are pretty remarkable numbers. We also, and we have always done this anecdotally, because some of the miniature breeds, they send us a hip film in. It may not have hip dysplasia per se, but it may have avascular necrosis or leg calf perth disease. It has been, recently we have just started a specific database for this. And the avascular necrosis has a totally different appearance, at least in my mind, than hip dysplasia. You basically start, I mean this is an example of a normal hip in a miniature breed. It could be a toy poodle. But the femoral head is well formed, it's congruent with the acetabulum, and the thing with leg calf perth disease is the, the vast majority of radiographic changes you're going to see are going to be with the femoral head. That's where the disease occurs. That in the young dog, there's a problem with the vascularization to the femoral head. And because of improper vascularization, the femoral head does not ossify, calcify like it should. And it basically just collapses. So you get this large radio, radiolucent defect in the femoral head. It, it, this dog probably had a pathologic fracture. There's a radiolucent line down here. The femoral head is totally malformed. You've got some secondary remodeling on the femoral neck. But unlike hip dysplasia, and this is pretty advanced for, for leg calf perth disease, but unlike hip dysplasia, yeah, you've got some minor changes with the acetabulum, a little subchondral sclerosis, but there's no really major remodeling of any kind, not like we get with hips. So Vic talked about radiographic positioning before. His idea of use of some kind of stabilizer, like a V-trough or a pad, I'm all for that. He was talking about strapping the animal down, binding the stifles together. I'm all for that. As far as trying to attach the dog, stabilize the dog to the table so you don't have to be in a room, I understand the rules of New York and they have to live with the rules that they have up there. But as an individual, it would drive me nuts if I had to do a hip radiograph on a dog that way. I'm, I guess I'm a kind of a hands-on person and I just want to be in there being responsible for how the dog's positioned. Personally, I don't think it's that hard. I did it for 14 years before I, when I was in private practice, before I went to work for OFA, and it really should be a no-brainer. This is your standard VD view. You know, the, ob the wings of the ilium are the same width. The obturator foramens are basically the same size, same width. Same width. Those are your, to me, should be your two key landmarks to know if you have proper positioning. The femurs should be parallel to one another as much as possible. You know, I don't want one coming out here and the other one coming out here. The patellas should be pretty much on midline. Now again, there's going to be some deviations. Some people do a little better. This one is really a pretty good image. We start running into issues, then like I said I will send them back. I will give you, and you 
probably already know this, you're probably already doing it, but if you're doing it by hand, if you're not paying attention to the person on the front end who's holding the front of the dog, if they're not keeping the thorax perpendicular to the table, you don't have a chance trying to position the pelvis. Because when that thorax starts to swing either way, the spine's going with it, and you're going to start putting torque on the pelvis. The other thing is that if you're holding the rear of the dog and you have a hold of the hind legs, you have to hold the legs somewhere above the hock. You have to hold the tibia. Because if you don't, you can't get enough torque on the legs to rotate them internally and get them parallel. If you're holding down around the hocks, then that hock joint is taking any kind of stress you're applying to try and get them parallel or to rotate them in, in, internally. So as Vic, Vic explained earlier, this is an example of pre-extreme pelvic rotation. It's easy to tell. The, the wings of the ilium are obviously two different widths. The obturator foramens are different size and shape. And as Dr. Rendano pointed out before, you can tell that this, the obturator foramen that's smaller than the other one or the side where the wing of the ilium is wider, that is your downside. That hip is closest to the table, closest to the, to the cassette. And it, what it does is it makes this hip erroneously look subluxated. It's probably a normal hip if you squared it up. But it makes, look, it makes it look like there's a decrease in the percent coverage, while at the opposite, opposite end, it makes the op, up hip look better. If a pelvis comes in, is rotated this bad, it will go back. The other extreme is while the pelvis is pretty nice on this image, the femurs are abducted and externally rotated. So it's, and it's a little over penetrated, at least on my slide, but the patella is sitting way out here. So what the external rotation does primarily is it rolls the greater trochanter over the femoral neck. This is, this is the greater trochanter right here. And it's rolled over the femoral neck. So you can't really get a good look at the femoral neck to see if there's any remodeling. Some, may, some people may mistakenly interpret this as remodeling. And it's not. It's a normal piece of, of anatomy that just superimposed over the femoral neck. Okay, we're going to touch on a couple of environmental issues that, that OFA has felt strongly about since day one. It's OFA's general recommendation that female dogs not be radiographed three to four weeks either before or after a heat cycle. And the reason for this, and when I was back in the, in the late 80s when I was doing the residency, I was lucky enough to have another resident that was a ther in theriogenology. That person had a population of female intact dogs. And what he allowed me to do was use these dogs to radiograph them at various stages of their heat cycle. So with, and I did these dogs awake. So chemical restraint was not an issue whether it was chemical restraint producing the subluxation or not. Because all I wanted to know was, was estrus causing any subluxation. And what I found out was this image is taken with a dog in estrus. And we were collecting serum samples and measuring estradiol, estradiol levels at the time. So this is an image of, dog, of one dog when it was in estrus. And you see that the femoral head is subluxated. I mean, here's the surface of the femoral head, the front surface of the acetabulum. And it's, it's not seated well within the acetabulum at all. It come back with the same dog when it's in an estrus. And again, you're radiographing a dog awake, no chemicals. And the hip looks much better. I mean, it's, the femoral head is much more congruent within the acetabulum now. So a spike in estrogen prior to the dog going in, female dog going into heat can cause some softening effect on the soft tissue, primarily um, the collagen. And it is our feeling that to this day that you shouldn't re re radiograph female dogs around the heat cycle. If for some reason it's an oops breeding, and you want to try and radiograph the dog after she's whelped the litter, then again, our general recommendation is you wait approximately a month from the time the puppies are completely weaned. This is schematic of the hips. On this side, it's showing you a normal hip, a normal joint capsule, normal round ligament, and it's the joint capsule and round ligament that you're, and the hydrostatic effect of the, of the 
synovial fluid that's your primary holding factors. So in a dysplastic dog, the joint capsule can be stretched, the round ligament can be stretched, even frayed or broken, and that then results in the subluxation issue. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is an example of a two-year-old Rottweiler that came through for an OFA evaluation. All three consulting radiologists read this dog as mildly, mildly dysplastic, based solely on subluxation. And you can see that the femoral head on neither hip, primarily this side, is covered within the acetabulum very well. This person, this Rottweiler owner, had been around for a while. She knew the ropes. She took this dog out to Clinic B, had the dog done with physical restraint only. This image came into OFA, and it was reported out as a good. And it is much better than the previous hip. The femoral head is covered. It's, you've got nice coverage. The surface of the femoral head in, in parallel to the front portion of the AC tablet is much better than the prior film. So it begs the question, which is the truer image? Well, this, this lady was a pen pal, or a phone pal, rather, for Dr. Corley years ago and myself. And she called Corley and was talking to Corley and wanted to know his personal opinion. He told her he felt the dog was truly dysplastic. And she decided not to breed the dog. But Corley also asked her that at some later date, if the dog went in, was chemically restrained, was possible at all to get another hip radiograph, would she do it? Which she was kind enough to do and forward to us. The same dog, about two or three years later, and now it's dog's obvious, obviously dysplastic. Because before, where you had nice, clean femoral necks, you now are remodeled. You've got remodeling coming across here. The little notch is filled in. There's some subchondral sclerosis in the acetabulum. So again, it begs a difference while, yes, OFA recommends chemical restraint. We don't require it, probably never will, but we highly recommend it. We think it's giving you a truer representation of the hip status. If a dog is physically restrained and images sent in, yeah, we're gonna accept it and evaluate it. And I think in most cases, you're, you're probably all right. It's the marginal dogs where you probably would wind up getting a mild, where if the dog was chemically restrained, you'd be better off. For last, what's it been now, three years, Eddie, four years? We're actually tracking the dogs that are chemically restrained versus physical restraint. And over two thirds of the images we receive, I can tell you the dog has been chemically restrained. Okay, we're gonna switch gears. In 1990, OFA started the, inter the elbow database. And this is thanks in large part to the International Elbow Working Group. This is a consortium of veterinarians and knowledgeable dog breeders from the United States, England, and Europe. And it's based primarily on a lot of work that, that Dr. Grondlin over in Europe pr produced. But with the elbows, or with any imaging for that matter, you can have plain film radiography, there's CT scans, you can do MRI. Back in the day when I was doing the residence, we had linear, what we call linear tomography. The International Elbow Working Group, because of looking for cost efficiency, cost effectiveness, and looking at mass screening, decided to use strictly radiographic evaluation. And their recommendations was basically the four views that OFA will accept. The one that is required is the extreme flex lateral. This, this, you, can, you can send in as many images on the elbow as you want but the study will not get read unless this flexed lateral is included. And what this does for us is it pulls the ankyneal process here out from behind the humeral epicondyle because it is this area on the caudal or dorsal aspect of the ankyneal process where you will routinely see the remodeling. And is the remodeling, it's the degenerative changes that is the common denominator denominator for all three inherited forms of elbow dysplasia, onionine ankyneal process, osteochondrosis, fragmentation or pathology involving the medial coronoid. Regardless of the disease, the dogs will all have secondary degenerative changes in this area on the ankyneal process, along the caudal border here, sclerosis through the trochular notch, and depending on how severe the, the arthritic changes are, there can be remodeling on the caudal margin 
of the lateral epicondyle or on the cranial proximal surface of the radial head. So depending on the severity of the degenerative change, that determines the grade one through three. If you want to do additional views, that's fine. We will certainly take them. The one that I highly recommend personally, if you're going to include other views, is this image here, which is a cranial caudal, lateral to medial, 10 to 15 degree oblique. And what this oblique does is it helps split off the medial coronoid process that you can have trouble seeing because it's superimposed beneath the radial head. So it splits the medial coronoid process off. It also gives you a real clear look at the articular surface of the medial humeral epicondyle, or condyle rather, where you will get osteochondrosis lesions. So the extreme flex lateral is required. This one would be your second best view. And then if you wanted to do an additional one, this is the, basically the neutral lateral. It also gives you a better view of the, of the medial coronoid process. But even there, un unless you had a really obvious fracture, it's hard to see. And it hides the ankyneal process. So you can't really see the changes that are associated there. The least useful one, in my opinion, is a straight cranial caudal. I mean, there's things to be picked up uh, for them, but not near as much as what you'll get off that cranial caudal oblique. So the International Elbow Working Group put this scheme together. If the elbows are normal, they're simply reported as normal. If they're abnormal, they're graded out one through three, depending on the severity of the secondary arthritic change with the buildup of the, the increase in the osteophyte on the back of the ankyneal process being a grade one where it's less than or equal to two millimeters, two to five will grade two, and a grade three is greater than five. By the time you get to grade three, you've got a grossly dysplastic arthritic elbow. So just real quickly, an example of our old friend, the ununited ankyneal process, this radiolucency here represents the physis that should fuse in most dogs by the time the dog is, gets to be 100, 120 to 150 days, or 120 to 150 days of age. So by five months, where you're going to run into an ununited ankyneal process, it should be fused. The osteochondrosis, the medial condyle, it's that radiolucent defect right there in the surface. And then if you've got good detail, this radiolucency here represents the fact, fracture bed for the medial coronoid process. And then this dog also has the classic secondary degenerative remodeling changes on the ankyneal process and a little bit on the radial head. So with really good film screen, if you've got an old film screen combination or with a digital radiograph, you can pick up these fragments, but for the most part, we're not gonna see them on conventional radiographs. Some of the reason for this is some of these medial coronoid process, instead of having a distinct fragment, which I, to the, to right now I do not like that term, I much prefer medial compartment disease or pathology involving the medial coronoid process. Some of these dogs, while there's no obvious fracture, they have a malformed medial cor coronoid process. On this articular surface in here, looks like somebody took a rongeur and just took a chunk out of it. So this malarticulation between here and the radial head is going to produce these secondary degenerative changes. Some dogs may even have the malformed medial coronoid process that's blunted, but then they'll have a fissure fracture through the articular cartilage. Again, you're not going to pick this up on a conventional radiograph. You may not pick this up on a CT scan, but you have the degenerative change for the common denominator. So this is what we're talking about. If you remember back on that initial view of the normal, this was a nice clean margin right here, and now he have this buildup of new bone. This is the secondary degenerative change that we're looking at in every elbow, plus there's sclerosis through the region of this trochlear notch. Grondelin and her work, which is really the basis for most of the, the, the elbow database, she went back, she identified ununited ankyneal process, osteochondrosis, uh, fragmented coronoid process, and then the fissure fracture. These are, these are the three to four inherited, well, three inherited diseases. Two of them, the fragmented coronoid and the fissure fracture, are basically the same disease. It's medial coronoid disease. 
but she identified that with the degenerative changes, they're much more severe where the more severe inherited disease. So the onionite and ankyneal process is kind of a no-brainer. It's a very large piece of bone. It helps stabilize the elbow joint. So by far, it has the most, most uh, degenerative changes and early on. And that goes along kind of with lameness seen too. In a dog with an onionite and ankyneal process, a lot of these dogs are, are, are lame. They come in lame. They're, they're presented with a lameness. It's easy to diagnose. They're underreported to us in frequency. Grondelin used a population of Rottweilers basically to examine the same thing. She had 270 dogs that were radiographed. 75% of them had degenerative changes in the elbows. Only a third of them were lame. The other two thirds of the population were clinically sound. And yet 68% of the clinically sound dogs had radiographic changes consistent with elbow dysplasia with a degenerative joint disease. And all of these dogs were, went to surgery and had the medial coronoid disease confirmed arthroscopically, which is the gold standard for that disease. So she had surgical confirmation in every one of these dogs. So I guess the point being there is just because we report a dog back as having grade one elbow dysplasia and there's no lameness, stick to your guns with a client. That dog shouldn't be bred, even though the dog is clinically sound because there's no good correlation between grade one clinically and what you'll see radiographically. Reed did this study on a population of dogs where he was looking at them when they were young and he had dogs at six months of age. Eight, eight, eight dogs in the population had zero radiographic changes and yet were, cl were clinically lame. The lameness associated to an elbow, but those elbows radiographically look clean. He then came back six months later, re-radiographed the same population of, the dog, of dogs. A lot of the dogs that were clinically lame initially now became sound. He only had two dogs that were lame, but many more of them now had secondary degenerative changes. Some dogs, when it appears when they're, when they're, they're young, and if they have an initial fracture of the coronoid, if it's not completely displaced, the speculation was on his part that some of these fragments may heal back down again. The dog that was once lame now becomes clinically sound because that piece is not in there moving. That was his theory on it. The patella luxation, this is kind of a no-brainer. It's easy, it's based on physical exam. You do it in your, in your office. Um, the normal patella, we all know, it can't be manipulated. It's, it should be a pretty passive examination where you just move the patella back and forth. It's going to have some movement as long as it's in the groove, but you, you will have some motion. It's not really considered abnormal unless you can completely displace it over the meteorolateral ridge. They're graded out either as normal or one through four with three and four being primarily permanent. They're, they're luxated, you can't physically push it back in its normal place. Radiographically, I'm sure you've seen, all seen this. Here's the patella in its normal position, at least on a radiograph. Here's one where the patella is luxated medially. I couldn't tell you whether this is really a normal stifle as far as patella luxation or not, because radiographically it can lie. That's why the diagnosis is based on physical examination. And like I said, it's real easy. You just, dog can either be laying or standing on a table. We've all done this. You manipulate the stifle through the full range of motion while you're palpating the patella to either medial or laterally. It's more common in medial luxation in your small breed dogs. Lateral is more common in the larger breed dogs, especially like flat coats and labs. But by and far, you know, usually bilateral, it can be, it can be unilateral. We've all seen that. And it's in a toy and miniature breeds, the medial luxation is 10 times more often than what you'll see it in larger breed dogs. But just be mindful that you will see it in larger breed, larger breed dogs. The cardiac database came on in the mid-90s. Initially, the ACVIM, College of Cardiology, because of a restriction in the number of cardiologists, did not limit it to cardiology only. 
They had it available for any licensed veterinarian. And it was primarily only to identify dogs that had congenital disease, disease that they were born with, PDAs, septal defects, tetralogy of Fallot. Most of these diseases, except for the PDA, and you had to do something surgically to correct that, most of these dogs with a congenital disease would be dead within a year anyway because of congestive heart failure. Over time, with more cardiologists becoming available, better technique with ultrasound, identifying normal flow volumes, the College of Cardiology thought there was time to go on to a two-tier type of thing. So while the congenital database is still available for all veterinarians, the dog has to be 12 months of age in order to get a number. It's based on auscultation, just like it always was. And the clearance for this is permanent because if you're clearing a dog against congenital inherited disease, it's clear. It's not going to develop a PDA later in life. The second tier is the advanced cardiac, cardiac clearance. This has to be, formed, be performed by a cardiologist. The clearance is only good for 12 months. It's still based on auscultation, but there are breed differences. Some breeds, like the Doberman or the Boxer, will require a Holter, a 24-hour EKG. A lot of the breeds will require an Echo because some of the diseases that are in inherited, like uh, uh, aortic stenosis, pulmonic stenosis, some of the cardiomyopathies, these are late-onset disease, and you may not pick them up until the dog is older. Unfortunately, the dog may have been bred prior to that, but that's the way it is with some of the late onset disease. Thyroid database, again, this has been around since the mid 90s. Doctors Reimer at Cornell and Ray Nockreiner at Michigan State are the two primary endocrinologists that put this database together for us. There's a number of causes of hypothyroidism. OFA is only interested in the lymphocytic or autoimmune thyroiditis. That is considered to be the inherited form of the disease. I say you can have other issues with hypothyroidism, including idiopathic, which basically is unknown, but it is the autoimmune thyroiditis that we're really concerned with. It's immune mediated, um, it's a progression of, progressive destruction of the thyroid gland over time. The dog can remain clinically normal as long as there is some normal thyroid tissue there, but eventually it will become um, abnormal, not with the free T4 and the TSH values. This is an example of thyroid gland with normal thyroglobulin. There's all these kind of nice little pink cells in here. This is normal tissue. What happens with autoimmune thyroiditis is the body produces an immune response against its normal tissue and you get this lymphocytic infiltration into the thyroid gland. So this is the diseased thyroid gland. So you, it's slowly killing off the thyroid, but even while this is going on, you may have thyroglobulin autoantibodies present, but you may still have a normal free T4 or a normal TSH value. That's called compensative autoimmune thyroiditis because there's still enough normal thyroid tissue there that the dog doesn't always got a problem. As the disease progresses and the thyroid tissue is complete, normal thyroid tissue is completely obliterated, that's what the thyroid tissue looks like. And it's by this point in time that you would also expect the free, T free T4 value to go out the basement and the TSH to go out the roof because the dog is no longer producing any, any uh, free T4. So it's kind of a negative feedback system between the pituitary and the thyroid. The free T4 level drops, it stimulates the pituitary to produce some THS, thyroid stimulating hormone, to stimulate the thyroid to kick in some more free T4. So the OFA thyroid panel includes all three of these. The most important from, I think, OFA's standpoint, as far as a genetic database, is the TGAA level, because that is the indicator of inherited disease and it's either broken down negative, equivocal, or affected. Certainly the equivocal dogs should be retested three to four months later if there's any kind of question. Maybe even some of the dogs that are mildly positive 
should be retested because it's an autoantibody test. Sometime there can be a bleed over from other antibodies that are present. That's why the lab tries to use, use a test where they're looking at uh, uh, nonspecific binding, which tries to pull out antibodies that aren't really autoimmune antibodies to the thyroid tissue. But it, it, you can get those kind of results. The TSH and the free T4 are still included because dogs that are marginal, that are in a compensative stage, the veterinarian and the owner, they want to know if there's still enough free T4 available for the dog to, to, to get along. If not, it's time to start supplementing the dog. So age factors affecting lab uh, results, age can be one, obesity. I think the two biggest ones are concurrent illness, stress producing some type of an antibody response, Prior vaccination, especially rabies, if it's close to the time the serum sample is being pulled, because that can produce a nonspecific antibody response to the test. Um, I think the general recommendation with vaccination is you really shouldn't vaccinate the dog within 30 to 60 days of it being vaccinated. Same thing with, with um, estracycle. It's our same recommendation on estrus as it is with doing hip radiographs, three to four weeks either before or after. And drugs. The only drug that I know of that I'd be careful with is if the dog is being medicated with sulfonamides, you want to pull the dog off or you want to wait until the medication is stopped for several weeks because the sulfonamides can, can falsely lower the free T4 values. Okay, we're going to kind of, oh, we've got a yellow light, got to get moving. So in general, with the phenotypic databases, we're looking for breed improvement. I mean, we're identifying normal dogs, but in the end, we want to try and improve things. So improvement's going to depend on the genetic variation within that breed, the incident of hip dysplasia, let's say in pug or English bulldog, compared to a sight hound. Using a superior type of phenotype or diagnosis, it would be hip radiographs, and then the selection pressure exerted. You take a breed like in the sight hounds, where hip dysplasia is very low incidence, it's going to be tough for those people to make an impact as far as lowering it anymore. Whereas you take the English bulldog, where hip dysplasia is very common, it's going to be difficult for them because they have a limited gene pool. So, but you've got to start somewhere. So, I mean, even if it's an English bulldog and it's mildly dysplastic, that's better than moderate or severe, and they may have to breed some mildly dysplastic dogs for a while because the gene pool is so limited. So the first thing, obviously, is normal to normal. And we know from our database, and this is on hips, where we've got just under 500,000 progeny, but we have the known hip score of the dam and the sire, and it's not hard to see, and I think the next slide makes it a little easier, that as the hip phenotype of the dam and the sire decline, the frequency of hip dysplasia and the progeny goes up and it's pretty equal distribution in percent affected, whether it be the sire or the dam. The other way of looking at this is if we assign a numeric score of one for excellent, two for good, three for fair. So this two down here represents an excellent bred to an excellent. And out of that population of almost 500,000 progeny, we still get out of excellent to excellent, we get just under 4% dysplasia. Excellent bred to a good jumps up to about six. A good bred to a good, just over 9%, or this could be an excellent bred to a fair. The point being is that as the hip phenotype in the breeding pair declines, the incidence goes up in the progeny. And you can just totally regard this 14 to 14, because that represents a severe to severe and thank God we haven't got that many in the database. This is the same thing on elbows. So a number one would be normal, and then we go down grade two, three, and four. And then this population had about 70,000 progeny, where we had the known elbow status of the breeding pair and the progeny. And graphically, you see the same thing. So a two represents a normal bred to a normal, a normal bred to a grade one. We still see 10% elbow dysplasia in a normal to normal, but that incidence more than doubles when we put, introduce it to a grade one, and more than triples if we breed a normal to a grade two. 
normals from normal parents. This is generational data. And basically, it's the same type of scoring. The better the hips, you know, um, a good represents an excellent and excellent, good to fair. But you're not only doing progeny, but you're doing pro pedigree depth. So you've got the immediate progeny, you've got their parents, you've got their grandparents. And you can see when you get that kind of pedigree information, you're bringing the normals and normals through that whole pedigree, what kind of an impact you can have. OFA data, pool data, is represented in two ways. One is pool, which goes back through 1974, represents every piece of information OFA's got on this dog. And it can only be used to, for, to estimate risk. To any way to any kind of make any kind of idea on trends is you have to go by birth year. And again, it depends on the prevalence of the disease, size of the gene pool, and selection pressure. But if you go to our website, you start looking through some of these breeds, and I pulled this slide back several years ago, but the top of them, Akita, excellent. So dogs born, Akita's born between 1981 and 85, we were seeing about 11% excellent in the breed. If you come forward, to 2006 through 2010 as 33% excellent. So they had a major increase in the best hip phenotype, and at the same time, they took hip dysplasia from 17% to 6%. So they not only improved the very best hip phenotype, but they made a marked reduction in the percent dysplasia. In most breeds, you can see the same effect. English setters, they started out with 3.5% excellent, through birth years 2006, 2010, it was 20%. And at the same time, they went from 17% dysplasia to 9.6% dysplasia. So it can be done. I said it depends on the size of the gene pool, the beginning incidence, and how much peer pressure is being exerted. And then the last one I think is important. I picked this up. Well, I've heard some other speakers talk about this too. But I've picked this up in, we read a lot of hip films, elbow films, for a lot of the um, seeing eye dogs. And in talking to Eldon Layton, who runs the seeing eye out in, in Morristown, he basically uses these same principles, normal and normal, normal from normal, and then he throws in litter mates. So if a person can collect information on an entire litter, the more information you have on that litter, the more power you have to work with. And most of these seeing eye places will not use a dog in a breeding program unless they have known normal hip information on over at least 75%, if not more, of a given litter. Over time, I've talked to a number of individual clients that use OFA. One of them is an English setter breeder out of the state of Washington. We talked to her years ago, and we told her about trying to collect litter mate information and the way to do it is that you're selling these dogs, they're going off across the country. So it's hard for you to get your hands on them, for you to physically radiograph them. But you can put a clause in your purchase contract that says, if when you have this dog neutered, spayed, or whatever you're gonna do with it, or if you're gonna keep it later on and use, potentially use it for a breeding dog, tab the dog's hips radiographed and send me the image. And she's been doing this since probably the late 90s now. And she has taken her incidence of hip dysplasia down remarkably in her line. I hardly, and I still see them come in, and I see a lot of them, and I hardly ever see a dysplastic dog that she has bred. So it can work. With that, I'll conclude it. Thank you.